so the final speaker uh, today or in the session is uh, Forozan Farahani. She's a PhD candidate uh, in biomedical engineering at the College of New York, and she is working with Lucas Para. Uh, her talk is titled "Modulation of Synaptic Plasticity in Single Neurons with uh, Transcranial Direct Current Stimulation." So the stage is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Um... Today I'm going to talk about modulation of synaptic plasticity in single neurons with transcranial direct current stimulation. Uh, so Mahima talked about uh, more in detail about what is transcranial direct current stimulation, but just shortly it's an um, non-invasive brain stimulation method that um, they put two electrodes over a scalp and they pass through a certain amount of current, this current will generate an uh, electric field across the brain. And what is interesting for us is to know that how this electric field is affecting a single neuron. Um, uh, based on um, computational studies, um, we know that um, there's going to be a gradient of polarization across a neuron, uh, meaning that one side of a neuron is going to be depolarized while the other side is more hyperpolarized. Um, knowing that what's happening in the level of a single neuron uh, computationally, uh, let's go back and then look for um, the debates that uh, what is the most effective way of using TDCS? Is it better to pair TD, uh, TDCS uh, with the training or uh, it's better to apply TDCS before or after a training? To answer this question, we have been using uh, uh, hippocampal uh, slices and um, using uh, tetra burst stimulation to see that uh, whether it's better to pair um, the electric field with the um, induction paradigm or not. A study published uh, uh, by a previous member from our lab, Greg Kronberg, uh, has shown that um, uh, pairing uh, DCS with tetra burst is able to modulate the synaptic plasticity and anodal DCS is capable of uh, boosting this um, synaptic plasticity. So the question maybe is like, what is the underlying mechanism uh, of uh, what uh, Greg has been reported? So we know that based on heavy and plasticity neurons that fire together, wire together. So uh, having this rule in mind, uh, we may think that if we apply electric field during the um, uh, induction protocol, we may push the postsynaptic neuron to fire more. That means that we are going to have a bigger synaptic plasticity. So to uh, test this hypothesis, uh, I've been using uh, uh, preparation that is more suitable for whole cell patch clamp recording, um, usually in studies that um, they are trying to investigate LTP in uh, um, patch clamps. They usually uh, apply ga uh, GABA blockers, and that needs to cut the CA3 area of the slice in order to prevent a seizures uh, like activity in the brain. The rest of the setup is very similar to what Mahima uh, talked about in the pr uh, previous um, presentation. So I will go and talk about what was the result of the experiment. So um, this is the uh, protocol that I used uh, to induce the synaptic plasticity. It's a slightly different than the one that Mahima described. Um, I tried to use this one because it's the uh, common protocol that people use in a uh, wholesale uh, patch clamp recording. And as you can see here, this is a trace of um, neural activity during the induction. And you can see that this induction is capable of making the postsynaptic neurons to fire. Uh, so what was the results? The results um, showed that um, anodal DCS is capable of um, inducing a higher amount of uh, plus, uh, potentiation. And at the same time, we saw that there is a correlation between the number of a spike that 
um, a neuron um, exhibit and the uh, amount of potentiation. So by now everything is like aligned with uh, what we had in uh, our hypothesis that we are going to apply electric field, we are going to have more uh, a spiking in the postsynaptic um, neuron, and then we are going to have higher um, plasticity. Uh, but then we wanted to dig deeper um, and see that um, how much this uh, synapt uh, postsynaptic spiking is important in inducing uh, more LTP. The first experiment that we had in mind was using a voltage clamp uh, recording. In that way, we will uh, clamp the postsynaptic um, neuron to have a certain um, potential, and we can test that if this is what, what we expect to do. Unfortunately, we re soon realized that uh, voltage clamp recording is not a suitable way of experimenting as uh, DCS in, uh, introduces an artifact and we were not able to remove that artifact. Then we decided that, okay, let's make this neuron not to fire. And then we used a, a sort of a blocker inside the uh, intracellular solution, which is called QNX. Uh, but then I realized that in order to block all the spikes, I have to use a very high concentration of QNX. So that made uh, the recording to be really unstable. So what we end up to do at the end was using current injection and trying to emulate uh, the effect of DCS uh, in the SOMA uh, by injecting the current. So that we considered two different uh, experimental setup. In one, we injected a depolarizing current and made the soma of the neuron to be about three millivolts more depolarized than the resting state. And the other condition was while having uh, an odal DCS, we will inject the high depolarizing current. Uh, in this way, we sort of cancel out the effect of DCS on, on the soma. Um, then what we saw as a result was indeed again we had um, the more spiking and the more potentiation and um, like results uh, seem to be aligned with what we expected but we saw something unexpected when we compared depolarizing current injection and anodal condition. While depolarizing current injection had higher potentiation amount, we saw that anodal uh, condition has a um, higher number of spikes, which means that in an anodal condition, we had more spikes, but we had less LTP compared to depolarizing current injection. So this was sort of puzzling for us why this is happening. Then, um, Fortunately, I had uh, a lot of recordings that I ended up not using them in my paper, but uh, they were helpful to solve this sort of problem. I saw that in some of the neurons, when I block the GABA, uh, the moment that the electric field goes on, I see a spontaneous activity before starting the theta burst stimulation. While this behavior uh, uh, was absent, when the GABA input were intact, or uh, when the intensity of electric field was uh, lower. So we thought that maybe DCS is um, inducing sort of a spontaneous activity in the neurons, and um, this may sort of affect um, what we are uh, seeing in the LTP. So in order to sort of bridge what we are seeing here in a as a spontaneous activity to LTP, we have started to use a comp computational model Again, Greg Kronberg uh, in his publication has um, shown a detailed morphological model in order to uh, combine the effect of DCS and synaptic plasticity. What I've done was adding a parameter for a scaling synaptic plasticity. Um, this was due to a previous publication showing that a network uh, burst activity can uh, modulate the amount of synaptic plasticity. And this is due to um, the changes in resources available during the synaptic plasticity. So I used um, what I've um, explained shortly here in my um, computational model. This is this here, you can see a, 
sort of a visualization of how membrane polarization looked like in my model in these three different conditions. Um, and then I uh, tried to do the modeling for um, showing the effect uh, of um, this uh, spiking, especially the um, spontaneous network activity on LTP. So I was able, with the model that I suggested, I was able to uh, capture um, the effect both on the number of um, spike counts that I had, and, uh, and also I was able to uh, show the effect on the LTP. So this shows that um, this uh, spontaneous activity is sort of acting as a homeostatic uh, mechanism and uh, sort of limiting the amount uh, of uh, potentiation that we expect from anodal DCS. So at the end, what we um, saw in this study was, first of all, we had like a direct evidence of um, how DCS is affecting a neural ex uh, excitability and how that can change the heavy and uh, synaptic plasticity. At the same time, we realized that DCS um, can induce a spontaneous activity when uh, GABAergic inputs are blocked. And this spontaneous activity can uh, sort of um, trigger a homeostatic plasticity mechanism. And at the end, our result is a mix of heavy and plasticity and a homeostatic plasticity. At the end, I want to thank uh, the, uh, my PI, Lucas Parra, people in our lab, especially uh, Greg Kronberg, that was very helpful um, during the, uh, this study and other people in a neural engineering lab and um, I'm ready for if you have a question. Thank you, Ferozan. It was a very nice talk. Thanks a lot. Um, so you can post your questions on the Q&A section, if you like, or on the talk, uh, the chat, sorry. Um, Okay, so for now, I don't see any questions, so I can maybe ask um, my question. So um, you mentioned that you observed a spontaneous spiking activity right before stimulation. Uh, that was, I mean, uh, you also said uh, you wouldn't expect uh, something like that but maybe can you uh, elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, um, previous uh, study, one study that we had in our lab, um, they were uh, doing um, experiments in cortical slices and uh, another sl uh, a study in another lab that they used hippocampal uh, slices. They showed that um, applying an uh, electric field over 30 volts per meter may induce a spontaneous activity while I was using an um, intensity that was in a lower uh, bound of that threshold. So I didn't expect that with 20 volt per meter, I will see a spontaneous activity, especially having in mind that based on our model, uh, 20 volt per meter in um, and a slice, which is like silence, it's inactive. It's not like a um, human brain, which is like an active state. It's very far away from the threshold for a spiking. And 20 volt per meter is about, uh, it generates about three millivolts maybe polarization in a, in a pyramidal neuron. So it was not expected with three millivolts of um, polarization, I get to make like a burst of activity in a neuron. So that was like sort of surprising and wasn't expected for us. Thank you. Uh, we have one other question from Max Korbmacher. Um, so Max says, thanks for the interesting talk. To which degree do you think uh, you can, uh, sorry, do you think your findings generalize beyond the hippocampus? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, one thing that makes hippocampus and this um, Schaefer collateral and CA1 um, sort of secretory 
uh, very suitable for our studies is that the way that um, presynaptic neuron and postsynaptic neuron are organized. Um, so in this way, we are sure that like we probably are not affecting the presynaptic uh, input uh, directly. Um, but I think that um, knowing that what it's going to happen when uh, we have a more controlled system, we can better generalize it in other uh, area of the brain, like cortex, um, which we are interested to do experiment in, but it's more difficult to interpret the result uh, when electric field is not only affecting the postsynaptic neuron and it's affecting presynaptic neuron at the same time. Thank you. Uh, also, thanks um, very much for the question. And we came to the end of our session. Um, I would like to thank all of you uh, again, the speakers uh, for the wonderful talks and also the attendees. Um, and special thanks to our backend, Said Salehi, uh, who's been doing all the technical work. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of uh, NMC and have a nice uh, day your evening. <laughs> bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.